Great. So hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. For those of you who don't know, my name is Kira, and I'm a network coordinator here at Climate Caucus, and I'm calling in from Barrie, Ontario, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people, which include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. So today's call will focus on municipal climate plans and electric transit systems. And we have two very inspiring speakers with us today. So first we'll hear from Martin Bean, who is the CAO of Rome Transit in Banff on their move to zero emission vehicles. And then we'll hear from Ian Pickett, who is the manager of sustainability and climate change at the District of Squamish on their climate plan. So just a reminder before we get started, uh, there will be some time after each presentation for questions, but I'll have to be very cognizant of the hour that we have together. And please remember to put yourself on mute if you're not speaking. So now I'll officially introduce our first speaker. So Martin Bean leads the Bow Valley Regional Transit Service Commission, operating local and regional transit services in the iconic Canadian Rockies. With over 35 years of leadership experience in the transportation industry, Martin is leading Rome Transit in its move to zero emission vehicles. Martin and his family have lived in the Bow Valley for the past 12 years, and he has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Waterloo and an Executive Leadership Certificate from the University of California at Berkeley. So thank you so much, Martin, for being here and take it away. Great. Thanks, Kiara. I'm glad to be here and, and uh, talking about buses and the change to zero emission. I'll just start uh, sharing my screen. And there we go. So I'll just um, briefly talk about the Transit Services Commission and how we came about a little, little bit of the history. Um, in we operate in Banff, Canmore, and Lake Louise area. So that's known as the, the Bow Valley, and we pretty well cover the whole Bow Valley. So in, in uh, a little bit of history, challenges with congestion in Banff started many years ago. And in 2008, the town of Banff decided to start their own transit operation and bought four uh, hybrid diesel buses and began operating a local transit service in Banff. And over the next few years, started to see a need for increasing the reach of transit in the Bow Valley. Many private operations had tried to connect up Canmore and Banff before, but just weren't successful for many reasons. So in 2011, the partnership between Banff and Canmore and Improvement District 9, which is basically everything in Banff National Park that's not within the town of Banff. Uh, it was decided to form a partnership with the goals of improving transportation opportunities, getting people out of private vehicles and achieving some synergies through collaboration. So I report now to a board of two councillors from each place and we have some um, Definitely a lot of cooperation between the municipalities and a lot of support in, in growth of transit in the park. In addition to the board, Parks Canada sits uh, at our board meetings as a non-voting member. And they've also participated in a lot of our route expansion over the last few years. So our, our routes currently uh, go right through the Bow Valley from Canmore on the bottom right of that map, through Banff and out to Lake Louise. And we've seen huge changes in people's behavior since that 2011 and, and introduction of the services that we offer. We have Banff local service, Canmore local service, and then we have connections between Banff and Canmore and then connections out to Lake Louise as well as seasonal routes that are operating to a number of tourist attractions uh, where parking and excess vehicles are a problem with sometimes lineups a couple of kilometers down on the road of people trying to park on the side of the highway. So we're, we're effectively working to reduce a lot of those challenges. Our ridership um, has grown significantly over the years from 
virtually nothing when we started or a few hundred thousand just in Banff local to 2019 was um, over 1.5 million people used Rome Transit services. Uh, a lot of visitors as well as residents using it just to get around the valley. Our Canmore to Banff service alone was about 200,000 riders in 2019. And then our Banff to Lake Louise service is about 115,000. And that was in its first year of operation. And the Lake Louise service has been particularly good in that it allows residents of the hamlet of Lake Louise to be able to travel outside of Lake Louise for groceries, for uh, doctor's appointments, pharmacy, uh, anything they need to do. So contributes to the quality of life there. Unfortunately, when COVID came in, transit was one of the um, larger hits with over 90% of our ridership lost almost immediately. For a few months, we had to maintain the two meters between people on the buses, which meant our maximum capacity on a 40 foot bus was about 10 people when in a normal time you could have standees on a local service and carry up to 70 people. So it's a big difference, but the recovery is happening and the, the uh, behavioral changes are, are coming back. Um, future, we're looking at ways to improve our service and offer service to other places for the reducing congestion. So more trailheads, expanded frequency, making it more convenient for people so they don't have to think about whether they should drive their car or not. They can just decide to get on a bus easily and you know whether it runs every 15 or 20 minutes. And then more connections within Lake Louise and potentially to Calgary. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about our fleet, where we're at now and where we're going. So Banff was um, pretty well ahead of the game with, starting with the hybrid buses back in 2008. And since then we've added more uh, biodiesel buses and we now have a, flight, a fleet of biodiesel and hybrid buses and uh, of varying types. In Camor, the picture on the bottom right, that's a 30 foot bus, just because we're going into more community type areas and um, the smaller bus is necessary. A key to our, all of our services are that they are fully accessible. And also all of our buses have bike racks. So we have uh, capacity for three bikes on all our buses and six bikes on the Banff to Camor route. A lot of people will take the bus one way and then cycle on the Legacy Trail, which goes beside the Trans Canada Highway through the park. It's about a 25 kilometer paved trail connecting up the two municipalities. And then in addition, when we started the Lake Louise service, we added some highway coaches. It's a longer route. It's about 45 minutes between Banff and Lake Louise. So these are a very unique vehicle. They're a uh, fully accessible uh, highway coach with a wheelchair ramp. Most highway coaches, if they are accessible, they have a lift, which is, it, it's pretty inconvenient for the person in the wheelchair and it also takes between 10 to 15 minutes to load a person. Whereas on these highway coaches, you can uh, go up the ramp and then there's a couple seats for companions and a couple of wheelchair spots on a lower level. And then the majority of the seating's on the upper level. And then just this picture here, and just talk a little bit about the municipalities in which we operate. This is Banff. The top picture is Banff in 2010. Um, lots of cars, lots of, lots of traffic. Uh, buses integrated into the mix, but buses not going any faster than the cars. So you're, you're not really saving any time. Over the last couple of years, Banff has implemented a pedestrian zone, pedestrian only zone in the downtown area. So this pedestrian only zone in 2020 was primarily to respond to the pandemic. However, it's now become an attraction and a way of encouraging walking, cycling, and using transit. So last summer, we integrated the Rome Transit Service 
into the pedestrian zone. So now if you are traveling or walking down Banff Avenue, you'll have buses with, um, we have bells on the buses. It's, uh, we took that from Vale, who also does this. And there, it's just a ding every four or five seconds and just kind of makes people aware that there's a bus coming and a little less uh, intrusive than honking a horn at people that are crossing the roads. And then Camor, we have a, a local service that's fare free and it's a regular method of transportation for locals. Uh, challenges in Canmore, uh, Lake Banff is four square kilometers, easy to operate transit. Canmore is 68 square kilometers. So definitely more difficult to provide a frequent and efficient transit service. And we're just implementing some more changes and getting some strong support from council to increase the service in Canmore. And then the Lake Louise service is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it supports the locals, but it also helps to reduce the congestion. Um, Parks Canada has just recently implemented paid parking, uh, which will help and a number of other initiatives connecting their local shuttle service with our service to help reduce people's need to be on uh, in their own vehicles. So moving a little bit into our, our planning for electrification. So uh, prior to 2021, all of our buses other than four were parked outside. We were renting space in the town of Banff's fleet shop uh, to be able to park a few buses inside. Uh, this created huge winter challenges. And then with growth and the pending arrival of electric buses, we needed a new home. So this facility was uh, built by the town of Banff and is designed to be a net zero LEED certified building. It uses solar power and employs a district heating system that heats four town buildings in the area uh, using ground up scrap wood like pallets and, and other types of wood. So we've got no, no furnace. Uh, the solar power either goes directly into use for the building or charging buses or goes back to the grid. So this building was completed. Uh, we just moved in in the spring of 2021. So we've been in just under a year now. Uh, 680 solar panels on the roof, uh, parking indoors for 12 to 15 buses. And then we also have a dispatch center um, and a training room with a state-of-the-art simulator. The simulator was designed in France, uh, has local Banff, Lake Louise, Canmore roads, bus stops, our garage. It's gonna be used for initial and ongoing training. And it's estimated right now that about 40% of our training will be done in the simulator, which further reduces emissions by not having to go out in a bus uh, for 40% of training of new drivers. And now we'll get into our road to electrification. So we're a pretty small organization. We've gone, um, I joined in 2015, we had seven buses and we are, this summer we'll be at 30 buses. So there's been a lot of support, a lot of growth, um, but with a small organization, you don't have the ability to do all of your own research and, um, do what's necessary to determine what the best steps for moving into electrification or other zero emission uh, opportunities are. So we learned that the city of Edmonton was doing um, substantial research, a couple of years of research into electrification. And we connected with them in 2018. They were just in the process of finalizing an RFP for 40 electric buses. And we were lucky enough in 2019 to be able to order three Proterra electric buses through the city of Edmonton's contract. They have an onboarding clause in their contract that, that allows any other governmental agency to be able to join with them and purchase. So we did that in 2019 for delivery in spring of 2020. And then COVID happened and delayed things like it did for uh, most people. So delays in parts availability and factory operations caused a delay to our delivery timeframe. So the buses weren't ready for the summer of 2020. 
which was okay um, because we reduced service in 2020 anyway. So they were completed in September of 2020. We stored them at their factory until the spring and then took delivery when our new building was uh, completed. So 2021, March to May, we were moving into a new building, um, taking delivery of three electric buses and ramping up service for uh, what we thought was going to be a busier season than 2020. It, it was not as busy as we thought, but there were a lot of challenges and a steep learning curve for uh, operations, um, drivers, and maintenance. So the vehicles pictured here are two of the first three Proterra buses received by Rome. Um, we had them wrapped at the factory. Our, um, part of our brand standard is that every bus is wrapped with a different animal uh, that can be found in the national park. And it's either a different animal or the same animal in a different season. So here you have a, a pine marten and a snowshoe hare on these two buses. Uh, they operate primarily on the Banff local routes. And we've got, as I said, about nine months of operation uh, that's happened on them already. So we're starting to gather the data and figure out the differences between our diesel bus operations and our, our electric bus operations. The charger or power control system, the uh, big unit um, on the left of that uh, middle picture, it's a 125 kilowatt charger with two pedestal mounted dispensers. So this charger sits on one side of the garage, the dispensers sit in the lanes where you need them for charging, and they can be located up to 500 feet away from the power control system. I'll show a picture here of our, our actual garage. What we chose to do for space, um, we're limited on space, both for the, the lead requirements um, I should say financially lead requirements. We wanted a small building envelope. So we chose not to have the pedestal mounted dispensers, but instead we put winches in the uh, ceiling of our building and the cables are lowered by a remote control to the lane and then plugged into the bus. So this just, this just saves space, uh, increased safety by not having a, a tripping hazard of a cable lying across the floor going to a bus. And so right now we have two of these PCS units and with two dispensers on each. So we have four chargers in our building. We have one more uh, PCS unit on order and this one's gonna come with three chargers. And then we're gonna be doing an analysis to see what the next steps are and how many chargers we need. It takes about 4.5 hours to charge one bus from zero to full. Um, we're just getting into some more uh, software that will allow us to determine exactly how much charge a bus needs for the route that it's going to be doing. So you don't always have to charge them to full when they come in. Um, and it significantly affects your electricity costs, how many buses you have plugged in at one time because you don't want to be hitting the, those peak costs with having a number of buses charging at the same time. So it's a, it's a real challenge um, learning the differences. Like a diesel bus, you fill it up and you drive it till it's at about a quarter tank and then you fill it up again and you keep driving. There's, there's a lot more planning that goes into these uh, electric buses. So the other options, I don't have pictures of them, but the other options for charging, and this is what Edmonton went with, they have a pantograph charger, which is an overhead charger that lowers down onto rails on the bus. And so they do that also in their garage, but it's just a different system. Ours lowers right down and you just plug it into a socket like you would an electric car. And then the other uh, pantograph charger that's available is an en route charger. And they charge, a lot of um, municipalities are looking at those for their downtown areas. They take about six minutes to charge a bus, but you have to charge them every 30 minutes. So they're more designed for um, shorter urban routes where you can just build in a 10 minute 
lay over at each end of a route and just continually charge the bus during the day. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges and the opportunities that we're seeing with our move to electrification. The uh, range is a challenge in winter. These buses operate really well in winter. We haven't had a lot of issues, but the difference in charge available is significant. In the summer, we're doing a, our full route from 6 a.m. to close to midnight, and buses are returning with 40% charge. In the winter, we're doing a, around eight hours and coming back with less than 20% charge. And we're learning as we go. Some of that is driver related. They, um, the buses have a um, defrost system that it operates off electricity. And also the heating on the buses can operate off either electric or they have a small diesel tank that can that you can use to supplement the heating and extend the range of the bus. But we found for a while drivers were using the defrost and just putting it on high and that would just cut your range in half. So it's uh, part of the challenge is the training and the learning on behalf of our drivers. Uh, the other thing that we are learning in our driver training is that the electric buses can regenerate up to 35% of their battery power uh, automatically by the driver just letting off the um, letting off the gas and coasting down a hill. It causes uh, creates regeneration of battery power. So if the drivers are using their brakes too much, you're losing that ability to regenerate your battery and you're hurting your range. So I think that's uh, you know part of part of the training that we're doing. Um, our drivers are learning more about these buses as we go. And then any new drivers are trained with the learnings that, that we've gained over the last year. And then the charging infrastructure, the, the plug and play, it doesn't always work. It's like a computer or anything else. Once in a while, you'll come in and the red light will be on and your bus is not charged. So we're learning what causes that and um, making changes and checking more often. We've just purchased some software where we can check in real time whether a bus is charging and what level of charge it's at. So we'll be implementing that over the next few months. The chargers are also set up for sequential charging. As I mentioned earlier, you don't want to max out the, uh, the grid. So your one bus on each charger, one bus will charge up to capacity and then the charger will automatically switch over to the other bus. So that creates dispatching challenges because if you're charging two buses with one charger, it's gonna take you nine hours to charge a bus. So we're, we're learning on, on that, what the best operational methods are too. And then the other uh, like challenge is cost. Right now, they're about a million dollars US for a electric uh, bus that like the larger battery packs that we need for our climate and our hills compared to about 700,000 Canadian for a diesel bus. So, but over the life of the bus, the anticipated savings are there. It's just that initial capital purchase. And then some of the benefits, and I'm, I'm not uh, the technical guy, but this is some of the information that we've gathered both through manufacturer and other studies. Um, a reduction of uh, GHG emissions by 609 tons over the 12 year life of the bus. We're uh, 12 year life is a US number. We're actually looking for about a 15 year life on our buses. And then benefits through less pollutants and air contaminants uh, compared to diesel, uh, reduced interior noise on the bus, exterior noise is, noise is also reduced, and the acceleration is smoother. And then a lot less moving parts on, a, on an electric bus than a diesel bus. Uh, virtually no fluids and reliable electric motors, so significant savings. And then operating costs are estimated to be somewhere in that 55 to 60 percent of those are diesel buses. And the gap could widen if diesel prices keep going up. 
So this, I've just got a few, few more slides and these are from the Proterra, the manufacturer. So I can't verify all, all these numbers, but you know, just the general 50% of new bus sales are estimated to be electric by 2025. Um, and around 10,000 full-size transit buses to be zero emission by 2030. A lot of transit agencies now have commitments to purchase only electric or other zero emission vehicles uh, as part of their uh, new purchases. And a number of other agencies are uh, uh, swapping out their older buses early to get into the zero emission technology. Um, just, you know, this picture just shows how fewer, how few moving parts there are. Uh, you know, it's got the, the, basically the drivetrain, the body is composite and light, and then the uh, battery packs located on the lower and up on the roof as well. And then just a couple of the, you know, if you do have a large fleet, they have a larger than our individual PCS units. So there's availability to provide fast charging, um, highly reliable simultaneous charging that I discussed earlier. And then the small fleet solutions, which is what we've taken advantage of. And that's kind of it on the uh, electrification. And then just talking a little bit about um, Rome and, and where we're going, our mission statement as an essential service, we operate, enhance, and grow our regional transit system through innovative and efficient transportation solutions to ensure that residents and visitors are able to live, work, and play in the Bow Valley without the use of a private vehicle. And I would just say that that mission statement is in line with our goal towards moving towards electrification. So I talked about the three electric buses that we currently have. We now have two more that have just arrived. And then we have five more that'll be in place by uh, February of 2023, putting us at uh, 10 electric buses in a fleet of, it'll be 31 at that time. So we're gonna have about 30% of our fleet electric. And just, you know, this slide just tells the market we're, we're um, catering to. Not only are we considered an essential service for locals in the Bow Valley, but we're also a tourist attraction. There aren't many transit agencies that are listed on TripAdvisor in their top things to do in, in Banff. So. And then our, uh, you know, this is a cartoon from our local paper a couple of years ago. Our focus remains on the Bow Valley, but also increasing our connectivity to, Cal to Calgary. I'm not thinking we're gonna go, be going to Kamloops anytime soon. So we'll just, uh, we'll stick with focusing on the Bull Valley and uh, improving our carbon footprint here and um, helping get people out of their private vehicles. And that is all I had. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Martin. So we do have some time for questions. So feel free to raise your hand or uh, use the chat if you'd like to. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, lots of exciting stuff there. Um, just the one question, the operational costs, uh, is that inclusive of uh, drivers and labor costs or is that more the, the infrastructure? That is the infrastructure cost. Yeah, so the dri driver and labor cost stays relatively similar. Okay, great, thank you. Sarah? Thanks so much. This is a really exciting endeavor. I mean, we're working on some kind of uh, Monday muffin bus uh, to town. And I really like the part where you're talking about um, the hamlet of Camor and being able to go to the grocery store on these uh, buses. But I guess my question would be uh, about the, the comic at the end with the how much to Canmore, you know, that is a gap that is like used to be Greyhound, but now is sort of shifting to 
different municipalities who are like willing to get ahead of things, right? Which not everyone has that capacity. And I think that um, I know that with the transportation work that I'm doing here in the village of Tassis is um, trying to get the regional district to be more engaged. I don't know exactly how that translates to the Alberta experience, um, but Kamloops is in BC, right? So there's definitely um, hope that we can have some kind of provincial or interprovincial um, cooperation to me. Thanks so much. Really exciting work. Yeah, you're welcome. And definitely just, just to comment on that, there are there have been a number of federal grant opportunities coming out lately. Um, still, the majority are for capital purchases, but there's rural transportation fund for um, small municipalities to be able to create a transit system. And they give uh, basically bonus marks if you're collaborating with another municipality. So I think the it's becoming a, more of a, uh, the awareness is there now, I think. Great. Ian, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks so much, Martin. A uh, couple quick questions. Was there a substantial cost associated with the electrical upgrades necessary for the, the facility? And were you able to find funding for either those transportation upgrades or the other uh, infrastructure required for charging? Thank you. Uh, we used uh, provincial funding. It, the electrical upgrades were not substantial uh, as we were, we were putting in the new building at the same time. So that worked out better for us. So we weren't just upgrading an existing transformer. Um, as far as the charging infrastructure, we were able to use a provincial uh, transit fund, the Green Trip Fund that's been around for a number of years. But there are actually now more funds avail available on a federal level that could potentially pay up to 80% of um, charging infrastructure and purchase of vehicles. Great, thank you. John, you're up next. Hello, very interesting, Martin. I'm from Golden, uh, just down the road. I was just wondering, um, do you, are you the one? Are you the ones responsible for that wonderful uh, bus system that takes you from uh, up to Lake Louise and Moraine Lake? So Parks Canada actually does. So we do the bus from Banff to Lake Louise, and then we do a service in the fall to Moraine Lake. Parks Canada operates the bus service to from. Um, it's going to be actually in the at the Lake Louise ski area, going up to Lake Louise and Moraine Lake this summer. Uh, however somebody coming from Banff will be able to seamlessly integrate uh, into the Parks Canada service using ours without an extra ticket cost this summer. I was wondering about that because parks are, I mean, jammed, particularly uh, some of the um, more, more popular sites. And if um, the parks is able to integrate mass uh, transit into there, uh, maybe it'll prevent jammed parking lots and a diminished experience. Yeah, I agree, John. And I think you'll see a big difference this summer with them using the Lake Louise ski area as their base. People can leave their cars there. Uh, plus, um, anybody staying in Banff, there's going to be a lot of messaging about leave your car at your hotel, just jump on Rome, and you can connect up throughout Lake Louise and Marine Lake. Sounds excellent. Thank you. Great. And Jenna. Hi, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious about reserve buses. I appreciate that there's some operational challenges with charging, but even in a fossil fuel fleet, you kind of need a number of reserve buses. So I'm just curious how many, if you have a sense of the ratio that you might need in terms of extra buses on reserve in the electric fleet. Yeah, we, um, we're both lucky and unlucky at this point in that we have a seasonal demand that more than doubles our uh, need for buses in the summer months. So with the lower range of the electric buses in winter, we do have that capacity of extra buses right now that we can substitute a, a couple buses in. And the range has been pretty good in the summer, like they do really well in the summertime. So no addition, our, our spare ratio right now is somewhere around 30%. Um, just for buses being down for for maintenance or or other reasons. 
Great, thank you. And Chris, did you have another question or is that hand from before? Oh, I apologize, that's left over. I'll turn that off, thanks. No worries, no worries. Does anyone else have any other questions? Juliana? Yes, hi, thank you. Great presentation, really interesting. And I'm wondering two things. One, is the wraparound really cool wraparound? Is that expensive? Um, but it seems also it probably motivates people to ride the bus. So I'm just kind of wondering about that whole bit. And I guess my other question was, um, in terms of governance, like, are you working with different municipalities or just one unit and how does that work in terms of regional collaboration sure thanks um so the wraps are um, they're about ten thousand dollars to put on and then we also we um, have a contract with local artists or local photographers where we purchase the images so there's that cost as well but overall the benefit we're known across Canada and further for the wraps, so so the definitely the the benefit is there. Uh, governance, we are um, we're a commission formed with three municipalities in an agreement. So uh, Canmore, Banff, and Improvement District Nine both have representation on our board. So all decisions are made collaboratively there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. It is time to introduce our next speaker. So Ian Pickett is the Manager of Sustainability and Climate Change at the District of Squamish. In this role, Ian's primary objective is to implement the Community Climate Action Plan, aligning Squamish's emissions with the IPCC targets for limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. And before joining the district, Ian was a professor at Quest University, teaching courses and mentoring students in sustainability, resource management, and physical sciences. So thank you so much, Ian, and take it away. Great, thank you so much. Sierra, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Great. My, uh, as Sierra mentioned, my name is Ian Pickett, and I'm the manager of sustainability and climate change here at the District of Squamish. I'm presenting from the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about our Community Climate Action Plan, or CCAP, and then also go into a few items of implementation of that plan. So I'd like to highlight a few key actions. Mm -hmm. And for some of these actions, I'd really like to focus on partnerships and collaborations. And this is something we've really benefited from in Squamish, and I think couldn't be a really good output from this group is the, the connections we make. Maybe these are there's opportunity for more collaborations for, for grants and initiatives. So the District of Squamish Council declared a climate emergency in 2019. And I started my role in May of 2020. So in a sense, I feel like I showed up a year late for my own job. There was already a lot of, uh, a lot of motivation and a, lo a lot of urgency around taking action, which is, uh, which is a good problem, uh, better, much better than, uh, than a community and a council not interested. Uh, so the climate emergency uh, was in the declaration was a pledge to reduce emissions in line with the IPCC guidelines for 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that puts us 45% below 20 10 levels by 2030 and toward carbon neutrality in 2050. So there are a number of major assumptions in our plan that are probably quite similar to other communities. So one is that we're looking at community emissions. So we're not looking at consumption-based emissions or emissions associated with large industry. Uh, another one that's quite probably local to British Columbia is that there's an underlying assumption that we have access to low carbon hydroelectricity. So if and when that changes, we will have to adjust our plan accordingly. But for now, there is very little focused on renewable energy generation uh, locally. Also, there's a little bit of a nuance between working toward a 2030 target uh, and also toward bigger targets in 2040 and 2050. So we don't want to take actions that will just get us above the bar in 2030 uh, that aren't thinking more long term towards 2040 and 2050. 
So our business as usual emissions trajectory is shown. This is probably somewhat similar to another, uh, a lot of your communities as well. So this estimate does account for population growth. However, our population is growing faster than anticipated. And you will notice that even in a business as usual scenario, there are some noteworthy reductions. These are mostly attributable to actions led by other orders of government. So the de decrease in vehicular emissions are is from the new vehicle standards and the province's zero emissions vehicle mandate. Also changes to the BC building code result in reductions. So you'll note how both the light dark and the blue dark segments stay quite constant, even though there is significant population growth. So on their own, some of our, some of our missions are going to decrease and some are going to, to increase mostly related to population. So if we don't do anything, our missions are gonna stay about the same. Our community emissions inventory is actually quite simple and fairly convenient. Uh, waste collectively accounts for about 20% of our emissions, existing buildings about 30% and transportation about 50% collectively. This is quite in line with other communities. However, our solid waste proportion is significantly higher than a number of other BC communities. So for example, Whistler is at 2% and Kamloops is at 5%. But this is essentially, it gives us three very clear categories of action uh, where we need, to, we need to make progress and uh, relative importance of each. So the CCAP itself is organized into six big moves or categories of actions. So each of these actions has a vision and a goal associated with it. Uh, the goal is uh, quantitative. So within the big moves, we have created strategies or categories of actions, which are different ways to tackle the big moves. Uh, and these are assessed by cost, leverage, and impact on GHGs. So that assessment helps us to understand what order to take uh, to undertake these strategies and even whether or not they made it into the, into the plan. And then we have discrete actions within the strategies, which are categorized as direct, incentivize, educate, or partner, which reflect the jurisdiction a local government has over the topic. These are in turn assigned a difficulty rating, stealing from skiing, we have uh, easy, moderate, or difficult as uh, blue squares, green circles, and black diamonds. Uh, one thing that's really important that we wanted to, to stress in the plan is that we don't want to just undertake the green circles first, we want to take a undertake a suite of actions so just something just because something is assessed as hard doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't undergo uh, right away. So our six big moves. Uh, broadly reflect the proportion of emissions in our community, so we have one big move that focuses on waste. Uh, two on transportation and two on buildings. And then finally, a broader organizational big move that kind of is a bit of an umbrella over top all of those uh, actions, you know, such as procurement or measurement or communication that will help us address all of them. So the, um, the actions are, are, they're given the difficulty levels and all told there are 125 actions in the plan, uh, each big move having four to eight strategies and each strategy having one to 10 actions. So in short, the, the plan is certainly a beast. Uh, it, is a lot to, it is a lot to undertake, but it does give us a really broad array of actions to take. And some of them were already underway when, when the plan started. And some of them are highly ambitious and dependent on other levels of government uh, coming on board or even our jurisdiction changing somewhat. So the modeling results that, uh, that show where our plan gets are shown in this quite handy graphic. So this is assuming that all of the actions in the plan in the CCAP are implemented. Uh, and you can see how different, differently sectors uh, respond. So are, are, in some, there are drastic reductions such as waste. In some, there are much, much less uh, significant reductions such as buildings, largely because our building stock is increasing. Uh, probably when you looked at that previous image, you noticed that we actually did not hit our target of 45% emissions reductions. 
So our plan, as it stands, falls short by 6,200 tons of, uh, of emissions. This is something that the, the group that put together the plan, we all struggled with this quite a bit. Uh, you know, is putting forth a plan that does not reach our target, is that just a plan to fail? Uh, personally, I really, really wrestled with this and I, I initially uh, spoke out against doing this. I thought we had to have a plan that got us toward our target. But, um, but the, our mayor and some other people in the, in the room brought up some really good points. Uh, and implicit in a plan that doesn't get us there is the, is the idea that the plan is not enough. We have to do more. Uh, we have to learn more. And we're, this plan is going to have to be highly iterative. And I believe that that's really particularly relevant in climate action because the, the field is moving so quickly. It's such a dynamic field. So, uh, so I ended up coming around to really appreciating this, that there, here's a plan. It's not enough. And what that means is that we have to be constantly looking for other opportunities to do more and go beyond what the, what the plan what the plan stated. So, uh, so I really like that. It's a, it's a kind of a baseline from which we, we have to do, but we have to be very opportunistic and look for, uh, look for other measures that we can take. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears a bit and talk about some specific actions that we are, we are looking at. Uh, I think, I feel like the orientation of these photos is a more truthful reflection of my day-to-day -day life than a nice ordered uh, Excel diagram things are coming at us all sorts of ways. Uh, we're taking what we can, we're doing what we can. Uh, a lot of overlap. Um, maybe not everything gets on the screen that that should. So one of the actions we that was identified as a, a strong priority right away was to make a better website. Uh, we worked very closely with the communications consultant and also our own communications staff. And we created a website for climate action that is explicitly linked right from our main menu, which I think is a very positive, uh, positive action. And it also speaks to the importance of climate action for our council. In our website, which I encourage you to visit, I, I'll have, I have it at the end, uh, we have several explainer documents. Largely, they relate to the six big moves and things that can be done and are being done uh, to uh, reduce emissions in them. And then we highlight and give additional information on notable actions. Uh, for example, on the top right, you can see a hopefully somewhat digestible diagram of our landfill gas flip. So anyone who's interested in hearing more, learning more about it can go and interact with the website and, and get a little bit more information. We put a fair bit of effort into highlighting uh, community champions. Uh, those are the, the two that you see on the bottom. So this kind of celebrates local, local act, prominent actors and things that they are doing. And also we have resources for educators in the, uh, the website. So this includes a really excellent list of library resources, uh, links to courses and ongoing programs, et cetera, that educators can uh, undertake as well as, the, as well as the general public. Our municipal energy and emissions plan, so uh, our corporate, reductions. Uh, the C, their community, our CCAP includes municipal reductions, but we, we determined in the CCAP that we need a MEEP, sorry, acronym soup here for you. Um, I'm going to be a little bit shameless, and uh, I personally think that our MEEP gives a, quite an excellent outline uh, with way better information. Just as a municipality, we have access to, to so much better GHG information about what's going on, and so we can really toggle it. We also have control over it. So this gives us a really clear outline of what we need to do municipally, municipally to reach those uh, emissions reductions. And to be frank, it is big. So we created three scenarios, one of which is a business as usual scenario, which blows way past our emissions reductions target. A second relates primarily to efficiency actions. It was some electrification. And a third highly ambitious scenario gets us to uh, high efficiency and almost complete electrification. So the, the second scenario gets us not quite to our goal and the third scenario gets us a little bit past it. So what the, what the plan is telling us is that we have to get between, we have to kind of pick and choose between, uh, between the two scenarios if, if we hope to reach our target. So just for context, in the, under a business as usual scenario, our 
recreation center alone will surpass our emissions target municipally. So even if we offered no other services, but to keep our, our, our recreation center open, we would exceed our target if we, um, under a business as usual scenario. Also, the ambitious scenario for this has our recreation center being retrofitted fitted to a passive house standard. Uh, those of you familiar will appreciate uh, how big of an undertaking that is. Uh, it will be extremely expensive. And there are currently only examples that we were able to find in Scandinavia that have, uh, have achieved this. So that, that, high, that high scenario, that you know, another example is it, it's complete electrification of our fleet, including large vehicles. The moderate scenario still has complete electrification of our, uh, of our smaller vehicles. One thing we that became very apparent is the the locked in emissions associated with the buildings we have take up a huge proportion of those emissions. So uh, the fleet is something that we're that changes over more quickly. So there's going to have to be very large uh, efforts toward fleet electrification if we are to hit this. Another action that we are undertaking is a heat pump concierge program. So we're uh, setting up a program where there is an actual human that you can call that can help you navigate the process to retrofit your fossil home and heating system with a heat pump. So we're in the process of setting up uh, communications, we're evaluating and onboarding contractors and getting the interface set up. And then starting in April or May, we'll begin uh, navigating people through the customer journey. So having someone help, uh, help homeowners through an energy assessment, contractor selection, installation of the heat pump, and also helping them access rebates and top-ups. The third stage of the, the program that we're excited about and we feel like is really necessary is program performance management. So researchers show in that a lot of people don't uh, optimize the use of their heat pump, and they're also not very familiar with it. So as part of this program, there's a little bit of extra funding so that the contractor remains available to the homeowner for a year after installation. And there's also some data evaluation to understand what the actual uh, performance of the heat pumps are and the GHG reductions. So we are undertaking this program in partnership with Squamish, sorry, in Whistler and New West. And the Community Energy Association is taking on the role of project managers. So this is a great example of how we've collaborated with a couple other municipalities and much more efficiently been able to, uh, to undertake this program. If we had undergone this alone, it would be far more expensive. And to be honest, it probably wouldn't have happened. Another activity that we're undertaking, uh, again, in collaboration with Whistler and also Squamish Nation and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, as well as the Community Energy Association, is a embodied carbon guide. So we're undertaking some modeling, and then we are going to evaluate and map the potential actions that a local government can take uh, related to policy and regulation, uh, trying to remove barriers and provide incentives for low carbon materials, capacity building, and also complementary strategies and advocacy for higher for higher levels of government to try to, to try to bring this about. So uh, we were very fortunate to get a game changer grant from the Community Energy Association. And again, are really leveraging the, the teamwork and uh, working with two other local locally oriented governments to, to bring this about. Uh, on the right, just for context, we're, we're entering this really interesting scenario where as our operational get, buildings get emissions get lower and lower, that the, the embodied carbon co uh, um, component of them is going to get relatively higher. So, you know, by about 2040, we're expecting the embodied emissions to be uh, roughly equal to the operational buildings of uh, emissions of a building. So uh, we're running a little a bit uh, low on time. So this is just a, a bit of a litany of other actions that we are that we are up to. I will I will leave these for now. But uh, if if while reading this, uh, any of them jump at jump out at you, please uh, please don't be shy to contact me, and I'd happily give you more information. Uh, one thing I I took a lot from Bill Gates's um, 
climate book. And one thing that was stated in the book that, uh, that really resonated with me is that societally, and I think as a local government too, we are just going to have to try a lot of different things. And we have to understand that some of them aren't going to work. And some of them that we don't expect to work are going to work. So that's something that I've really taken to heart. And we've, you know, at the District of Squamish, we're really trying a whole bunch of different things. And to be honest, we're not sure which ones are going to work, which ones are going to fail. But uh, we're confident that some of them are going to work. And even the ones that don't work, we're going to learn. So I will leave it at that. Uh, here is the, the Squamish Climate Action website. Uh, and if thing, we don't get a chance to discuss things and they come up, uh, please don't be shy about emailing me. And also I was able to talk to her executive assistant and here's Mayor Elliott's personal number. So you can call her day and night. Uh, she'd be happy to talk to you. I'm just joking. And I think this is much less funny because I don't think she was able to make the call. But anyways, that's not, not her real number. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. I'll stop sharing and welcome questions. Great, thank you so much, Ian. We are a bit tight for time, but if we do have a few minutes and Ian, if you're willing to, we can always run a bit later. Awesome. So feel free to raise your hand or use the chat. I think John has a question in the chat actually, um, wondering how well you are able to collaborate with other levels of government for transit along the Vancouver through Pemberton corridor. That is an excellent question. I might pass that along to my colleague uh, Dora Gunn, who I think is on this call. She might have stepped off, actually. Dora, are you with us? I see no, Jenna put like... an answer in the chat. She did? Oh, yes. Yes, she did. Perfect. Okay. Um, Not to steal your thunder, Ian, but yeah, go, uh, it was a very short response just to say that we've been working really hard. We've tried a few different models that we've proposed to the provincial government, and we're not getting a huge amount of traction. Um, I'm happy to provide more details on that if folks are interested. But um, yeah, regional transit's really difficult. Um, but I think trying to find creative solutions and keeping to, and continuing on proposing them to the provincial government is our only option at the moment. So happy to hear what others have put forward. Yeah, and I will say we're like we are the most ripe set of communities for a case study I can think of. So I, I'm just hopeful <laughs> that we can be poised as early adopters. Based on conversations with Dora too, it, it seems like one of the ways forward might be to really incentivize and enable existing operators. Uh, my understanding is provincial government is very aware of the, the existing services and quite wary of interfering with those. So, so the solution might end up being that they, they incentivize, they subsidize and enable existing operators to, to fill this. Great. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, Sarah. Hi, thank you. Um, my question was about the landfill gas flare and if that's something that is just burned off or is that something that can be captured uh, for use? Thanks. Great question, Sarah. So currently it is just being burnt off. We need to collect about a year's worth of data on the, we're not quite sure how much gas we're going to get. And also the characterization, the chemistry of the gas has a impact on how it's going to be used. It is looking like it is not going to be viable. It's, it's just not enough to, to feed into the, into the gas line. But we're, one opportunity we're looking into is to collaborate with Squamish Nation who own land nearby to, to utilize that for, for a smaller project like something like a greenhouse where they can they can use heat and the gas. So that would be something where they would use it right there, uh, yeah. heat their greenhouse and then grow tomatoes rather than feed it into a bigger, because like the gas lines, I'm sure are something that the, and this is something I've realized in a lot of ways, especially with renewable energy, it's like economies of scale just stomp out any gains that are won. So, uh, but it's, yeah, I mean, it, if you can use it right there for something, then it's a win. Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah, totally, yeah, the distance, it has to be so close. The, we are hopeful that Fortis has a huge, they've made some very strong commitments to renewable natural gas. So I'm wondering if their appetite for it might increase to the point where 
they will still want it, even though it's not <laughs> economically viable at all. But in the meantime, I think that smaller scale solution is what we're going to. Well, and I think too, that like long game, like when the emissions and I mean, the um, embodied carbon and the emissions are sort of on par, like you were saying in your graph there, uh, there's definitely going to be some like it won't be me and it won't be you and it won't be maybe anybody here, but it might be the kids that are like mining the landfills because there'll be like valuable things there that have already been utilized, right? But these are science fiction futures, sorry. <laughs> Great, does anyone else have any questions? I'm not seeing any hands. So I just want to, oh, Alex. Sorry, can I just say something really quickly before before you let everybody go? We're, yes. uh, something that we're looking into is um, to try and find ways to get funding for climate staff positions, climate staff, sustainability manager, energy manager, this type of positions for smaller communities. If you have, if you are or have <laughs> that staff position um, and would like to talk to me about it at all, I would really, really appreciate it because we'd like to see the different like ways that it happens. Um, and Ian, great presentation, great to hear. I would love to hear from you because um, you've done a lot of great work. Yeah, John. Sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> got to happen at least once a day, right? Yep. I remember from an earlier presentation, which I'm sure you, uh, you remember, speaking of um, communities sharing a position. If you know, a small community can't afford to hire full-time, another one might join with it and have a, a joint position as a way of uh, making something happen. Just want to throw that, up, throw that in. Yeah, and that's something that we're looking at, like especially funding for that position. So we're basically looking for the different types of positions that can come and what they might look like and what communities and types of communities they might serve. So if anyone has any input and wants to chat with me about what either what you want or what you have or what would you like better, um, I would really appreciate it. And I can drop my email in the chat. So thank you. Sorry, sorry to, to jump in, but I know that there's a lot of you in this group who that's relevant to. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank our two speakers, Martin and Ian, so much for being here today, for presenting and leading the transformation that is so needed in our communities. Um, so thank you so much. And to everyone who joined today as well, um, it was a great discussion and such a great turnout. Um, and I'll be emailing the recording and the slides to all of you very soon. So have a great day, everyone. <laughs>